format that we've talked about briefly is he'll do a little introduction of uh, who he is and what he's interested in. But a lot of it's going to be uh, questions generated from the people that are listening. And hopefully that you can come prepared with some questions and some areas that you'd like to know more about. And so this will work best if you uh, have something ready, but also don't be afraid to ask a question. The questions that are uh, probably the other question is probably somebody else here also has that. So ask your question with confidence. I think that'll help you move forward. Helen, it's going to be your job to watch this water. And if he runs low, run back and get him another bottle. And you don't want his voice to uh, get high. So I'll make it short and we're looking forward to hearing your thoughts. this to be a conversation. I don't want to give a lecture or anything like that. So uh, I very much encourage you to uh, ask questions or make comments or say something so that I don't have to say uh, very much myself. Uh, but I thought maybe I would give, give uh, you a brief sketch of, uh, of my background. Uh, I went to a school called Tenafly High School. That was my secondary school in Tenafly, New Jersey. The town where I grew up, Alpine, was too small to have its own high school. Uh, so we, we got bused about three or four miles away to Tenafly uh, every day. And when I was about your age, it wasn't possible, actually, to study economics in high school in those days, and I didn't really have much idea what economics even was. Uh, I guess my favorite subject was math, so I did, I did a lot of math. Uh, I probably didn't study as much as I should have. I hope you study more than I do. <laughs> uh, but uh, I also had a strong interest in music, I played um, clarinets and, and piano, and that took up a lot of my time. I uh, played some sports. I played uh, tennis, especially. Uh, and then I went to college, university. I, I went to Harvard. And based on my high school experience, I became a math major, which I loved. I, uh, I don't know how many of you have had it chance to study some mathematics, but it's it's a very beautiful subject. It, it's a useful subject because it, it can be applied in, in many different fields, economics, physics, engineering, and so on, but it, it's also very beautiful um, just on its own because you, you see patterns and, and connections uh, that are really quite artistic. I, 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 I think the connection between mathematics and poetry, for example, is, is really quite strong. Uh, so I, I was more or less expecting to be a mathematician or, or an applied mathematician. But then, more or less by accident, I decided to take a class in, in economics. In, in the American uh, university system, as you may know, it, it, they have what's called a liberal arts program, which means that you might have a major, I had a math as a major, but you're free to take courses in many different other areas too, uh, sample pretty widely. So I decided to take an economics class. It was a pretty advanced one, but I thought, you know, I was a little bit uh, uh, overconfident maybe, and jumped into this advanced class being taught by uh, one of the great economists of the 20th century. I had no idea uh, that he was at the time. I just decided uh, to take the class. His name is uh, Kenneth Arrow. I don't know if that name means anything to you, but if you can 
continuing economics, you will certainly learn a lot about Kenan Arrow. Uh, and the, the course was on information theory, uh, information economics. And I thought it was wonderful. Uh, it had the rigor and precision of a mathematics course. So we, we studied things using mathematical models, but I could see that the applications to social problems, to economic problems, was enormous. Uh, that I could see that economics could be a really useful subject for improving societies and improving economies. And I thought, on the basis of this course, that this is what I wanted to do. It was, a, it was such a great combination of social relevance and mathematical rigor. So um, I changed directions. And, and for my graduate work, I actually did a PhD in Canadero, uh, who I'm happy to say is alive and well today at the age of 95. And I, and I see him from time to time. I, I, I spent a couple weeks with him in Israel last summer at a summer school that he had started years ago. And I've taken over running it so, as of about 10 years ago. Uh, so I did a PhD with Professor Arrow and then um, became a uh, economics professor. And that's, that's how I got to where I am today. Uh, I worked at a number of different universities. I, I was trained at Harvard. Then I taught at MIT, which is not very far away from Harvard, for a few years. Uh, came back to Harvard, taught there uh, for a long time, for um, about 15 years. Then I left for a time. I went to Princeton to the Institute for Advanced Study, uh, which happens to have been the place that Albert Einstein spent his American years. He, he, he spent 20 years at the Institute. And I actually got to live in his house for, for 10 years. Not, not because of anything I did. It was just pure luck that the house happened to be available at the time uh, we were moving to Princeton. And then uh, after 10, after 10 years, I went back to Harvard, and I've been there um, for the last five years. So that more or less brings you up to date, so you have an idea of uh, who I am. And now I want to hear from you and find out who you are. So uh, the floor is yours. Where are, you, where are you studying and working now? What am I studying and working on now? Well, one. Um, one topic, and that's uh, what I've been giving some lectures on in this tour around Southeast Asia, is inequality. Uh, we all know how important a forced globalization has been over the last 20, 25 years. Globalization has worked miracles uh, Look at how far China has come. Uh, look at how far India has come. Uh, it's mostly because of globalization that those economies have been so successful. But there's a downside to globalization, which is that it tends, or at least this globalization has tended to increase inequality, that is, increase the gap between rich and poor. Because it tends to be people who are already well off, who already have some skills, who are the primary beneficiaries of, of globalization. Uh, people down at the bottom are more or less left behind. They don't, they don't benefit from globalization. In fact, sometimes they lose. Uh, and if you 
look around the world today, and you see how much uh, political disruption there is, a lot of that can be tied, I, I feel, to uh, incre increasing inequality brought about, at least in part, by globalization. So, so one of my main research topics in collaboration with a development economist named Michael Kramer at, at Harvard has been to try to understand why this inequality has uh, been increasing. Because in fact, in previous globalizations, for example, the great globalization of the late 19th century, where Europe and North America started trading with, with one another uh, a lot more intensively, uh, we did not see inequality uh, increase. In fact, it was just the opposite. Globalization was a force toward greater equality. Uh, but this globalization has been different and, and a major research topic that I've been involved in is trying to uh, first explain why it's been different, and but second, uh, what we can do about it to try to correct this increasing inequality. Yeah. You, you, you want to use a, a mic? Yeah. yeah. Uh, that way, yeah, that, use that way it'll come out in the recording. Uh, I feel like you're a man of compassion and Uh, spiritual uh, spiritual uh, do you think uh, the creative field and um, spiritual field has influenced the work and economics? That's a very interesting question. Uh, I'd have to give that. I'd have to give that some thoughts. Um, I got into economics, actually a lot, of, a lot of people get into economics because they, they would like to make the world better. Uh, and and uh, that can often be for, for spiritual reasons. Uh, in my case, um, I think it might have been more for for philosophical reasons. So an, an, another thing I was able to do when I was in college, when I was an undergraduate, was to take some um, philosophy courses. Uh, and in particular, uh, I got to uh, take a course with, with um, a great political philosopher named John Rawls. I don't, I don't know if John Rawls means anything to, uh, to you, but if, again, if you were studying philosophy, you would certainly know who Rawls was. Uh, he, he, he died, I guess, about 10 years ago. Uh, and, and his, one, one of his uh, principles was that uh, in trying to seek justice uh, for society, you should always concentrate uh, on the people who are worst off and try to elevate their position as much as possible. Uh, the, the, the term he used was maximizing the minimum. The, the, you, you look for people with the, with the lowest welfare and you try to uh, improve their, their position. He, I'm happy to say that that point of view was very important in political philosophy, and uh, it certainly had a big influence on me. Uh, so Obama's term is coming to an end, and do, do you think his the Obama stimulus has improved the America's and the world's economy throughout his eight year? Rain. And now that we're, uh, the America uh, is about to have a new president, do you think Trump's stimulus would improve on Obama's his current uh, current state, or would it actually put it into a depression, depressive state? Uh, so some big questions. <laughs> uh, for 
President Obama, I, I think his, one of his most important legacies will have been to save the US and to save the world more generally from what could have been a disastrous depression. Uh, the, the recession we saw in, in 2009, 2010 was pretty bad. In fact, many countries still haven't recovered from that. But it could have been a lot worse. And, and President Obama's policy in particular, the stimulus policy, which involved spending about $800 billion, uh, was an important reason uh, why that recession uh, was not a whole lot worse. Um, I, think, I think he would have liked to do even more, uh, but for political reasons, because of a divided, uh, uh, of a divided Congress, uh, he wasn't able, after the first couple of years, to get much done. But, but even so, he was able to do enough so that the American recovery uh, was set off on the right path. And, and American economics is so important for the world that that, I, that I think, was uh, a major ingredient in, in the world getting back on track. Now, uh, with Donald Trump, we don't know yet. The problem is that he's never held office before. He hasn't really, until this political campaign, he probably never really thought very much about most of the big issues of the day. The, uh, the infrastructure spending proposal that uh, he's been talking about um, actually sounds pretty good. Uh, if, 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 if he uh, undertakes that, I think uh, it could be a very positive step for, for several reasons. First, uh, uh, America really needs uh, a makeover in the infrastructure department. You have only to arrive at uh, Kennedy Airport in New York and see the extent to which it's crumbling to, to, uh, to understand that uh, many, many airports, roads, buildings uh, in the US need to be renovated. And now is a great time to do it because first, uh, there are many people out of the labor force who could, who could do the work. Second, interest rates are still pretty low. So the cost of undertaking this investment is also pretty low. Uh, and third, um, we, you know, we've made a pretty good recovery uh, from this recession, but we're by no means at full strength. And a stimulus like a big infrastructure plan could could be very good, again, not just for the US, but for, for the whole world. So if, if in fact, he goes in that direction, I think it will be, I think it will be great. Uh, but we don't really know yet what will happen, because uh, Mr. Trump has been big on rhetoric, not so big on detailed plans. So, uh, thank you for the question. Can have a question. Yeah. Thank you. I'm pretty sure you have done many things in economics, but is there anything in particular that you really feel proud of that you would like to share with us? Well, um, talking about. Uh, you know, when, when, when you ask a researcher to talk about their, their uh, research projects, uh, it's a little bit like asking
asking them to talk about their children. Uh, and you don't want to play favorites. <laughs> Just as parent that doesn't want to play favorites with children. Uh, but I, I, probably I should mention the work that was singled out for the Nobel, um, which, is, which is called Mechanism Design. Uh, so that, it's mechanism design that I'm probably best known for. You, you may not know what mechanism design is, but it, I like to think of it as the reverse engineering part of economics. So rather than looking at existing economic institutions and existing economic procedures and trying to forecast what the outcomes of those procedures will be, that's what most economists do. In mechanism design, we start with the outcomes. We say, these are the outcomes we would like to achieve. And then we work backwards to figure out what kinds of institutions or procedures will give rise to the outcomes we want. Uh, so one of the things that I did was to come up with a, uh, a criterion by which we can judge if a particular set of outcomes that we would like to have are achievable at all. We, so, sometimes we have goals which are simply impossible to reach. Sometimes we have goals which are realistic. How can we tell the two apart? Uh, how can we tell when we can achieve a goal, when we can't achieve a goal? Is, is there a, a formula we can apply or a criterion we can apply to, uh, to make that distinction? Uh, and I came up with such a criteria. It, it's called monotonicity. Uh, and it also uh, allows you to uh, to build a, so um, imagine that your goals are achievable. Um, what mechanism will achieve them? Uh, one of the things I was able to work out was a, an algorithm for building a mechanism, a procedure for building a mechanism which will achieve specified goals, provided that those goals are achievable at all. So it's primarily those, those two contributions, the criteria of monotonicity and the, the algorithm for building a mechanism that, uh, that I was recognized for. <coughs> In your opinion, do you think you're a non-interventionist or an interventionist, and why do you think that you're that? Very, very good question. Uh, am I an interventionist or a non-interventionist? And maybe this is a cop-out, but I'm going to say uh, some of both. <laughs> um, there are many things that, that markets do very well and that we're probably best not interfering with. Um, if, you know, if, if you're talking about the, uh, the market for agricultural goods, uh, most manufactured goods, there's uh, no particular reason why the government has to get involved in these markets. They work uh, almost automatically. The, 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 the so-called invisible hand that Adam Smith talked about applies to markets like that. Uh, but not all markets work so well on the, completely on their own. Uh, and one, 
example of a market where government intervention is important is, uh, is financial markets. Uh, by financial markets, I mean markets uh, where banks who are the primary, I'm going to use the word bank for any institution that makes loans for productive projects. For entrepreneurs dream up projects, but they need financing, so they go to banks to get the financing. And banks serve a, an important role, an essential role, in a modern economy because they, they allow the entrepreneurs to, to realize their dreams and, and, and put these projects uh, into practice. Uh, so banks make loans. Uh, but banks typically try not to make loans using just their own money. Uh, because, you know, if you can use other people's, if you can invest using other people's money, you have leverage. Uh, and you can get a bigger return on your own money. So, so banks will typically uh, themselves borrow money from other banks, from other investors, to, to put into an entrepreneur's project, which, which is fine. Le leverage uh, allows uh, resources to be spread further around an economy, and, and it allows more projects to be undertaken. Uh, but there's a risk if there's too much leverage, which is that if some of these projects that are being invested in turn out not to, to work, if they're, if they're failures, then not only is the bank that's invested in these projects going to suffer, but all the people who, all the other banks and other investors who put their money into the project will also suffer. In fact, you can have a chain reaction of failures. First of all, the loan goes bad, and the bank that made the loan fails, then the institutions that went to the bank fail. You can have a domino effect where there's failure after failure. Even if the original failure was quite small, it can be multiplied until you get a system-wide failure. That's actually what happened in 2008, 2009. There were a few failures in the, in the mortgage market. In fact, just a small corner of the mortgage market called the subprime mortgage market. But those failures spread and ended up enveloping the entire financial market, which, which came almost to a standstill. And when the financial market comes to a standstill, everything comes to a standstill. So we, we were in deep trouble. Now, in my view, what happened then was a failure of governments to get properly involved. If, if they had been regulating these banks properly, they would have prevented the banks from over-leveraging themselves, from, from using too much borrowed money. Uh, if, if, they had, if they had required that banks not over-leverage, we would never have got it. To, uh, that fix in the first place. So, so regulation uh, for some markets, I think, is essential. Financial markets are one of them. Uh, the, the other place where government can get involved, and that goes back to the questions about uh, uh, President Obama and, and President-elect Trump, the other place where government can get involved is to try to kickstart an economy that has got into a rut. If, if you're if you're in a uh, if you're in a depression or a recession, uh, your the whole economy is operating at a at a lower than than optimal level. You want to move the economy up a notch or two. You can inject a stimulus uh, to get things going. This is, this is something that the 
economist John Maynard Keynes uh, advocated back in the Great Depression of the 1930s, his policy worked then, uh, and it worked again when, uh, when President Obama used it for the, for the recent recession. So that, that's another place where inter intervention is important. But there are plenty of there, there are plenty of points in the economy which don't really need uh, intervention uh, by governments. And I've just given you a very long answer <laughs> uh, to, a, uh, to a brief and to the point question. <laughs> Um, you said that you see a lot of connection between mathematics and economics. Right. So I was wondering if a person were to open a new business, would there be a correct formula that would make his or her business successful and just follow that formula in mathematics to make it successful? I wish there were a magic formula which would tell you whether a business is going to be successful. It, in the end, I think uh, it's imagination uh, that is still the most important ingredient in making a successful company and coming up with a good idea. Uh, and that, that doesn't require mathematical formulas. That just requires some, some cre creativity. But mathematics can be used by business people and is, is used for, uh, for good purposes. For example, um, it can be used to analyze complicated decisions. S suppose you're considering making an investment and you don't know exactly what the possible outcomes what, what, well, you know what the possible outcomes of the investment are, but you don't know which outcome will actually emerge. That is, you, we could have outcome A with probability 30%, and we could have outcome B with probability 40%, and outcome C with probability 30%. You don't know whether it's going to be A, B, and C. So how do you evaluate uh, the, the investments. Well, that's where the mathematical tool called decision analysis comes in. Decision analysis allows you to take a uh, fairly complex decision problem, like whether to make this investment or not, and break it down into its component parts. Uh, and then analyze the decision problem uh, in <coughs> little pieces, put the pieces all back together and, and, and get an answer. Uh, that's one place where, where mathematics is quite useful. Uh, another place where it's useful is in, uh, in strategic interaction, that's called uh, game theory, uh, which is one of the things I'm interested in. Uh, if, if you're a company uh, and you're operating alone in, a, uh, in an industry, that, that's great. But typically, uh, you will have competitors. Uh, and if you have competitors, you want to be able to anticipate what those competitors are going to do. And the competitors are going to want to anticipate what, what you're going to do. So you have this strategic interaction. Everybody is trying to anticipate what the, what the other company is going to do. Uh, and, and so how do you analyze this, a situation like that? Well, you use game theory. And game theory is also a set of mathematical tools for breaking complicated strategic interactions down into uh, more simple, analyzable components. So I uh, hope that helps. Yeah. So um, entrepreneurship used to be something that people did out of grit or even necessity. 
but today our students are studying it and it's being taught in universities around the world. So are we living in an age where the small business will actually take over the big business or are we going to see the opposite happening in this century? I think uh, whenever new products come along, new technologies come along, they're always at first created by small business. So, so small business tends to be the leader in, uh, in uh, the innovative cycle. Uh, you know, you, you, you look back to uh, an enormously successful company like Microsoft. Microsoft didn't start out as a behemoth. It started out uh, with Bill Gates working in his garage to, uh, to figure out how to uh, come up with a, uh, a way of providing software for personal computers. If you look at uh, Facebook, uh, Facebook didn't start out as a billion dollar company. It started out with Mark Zuckerberg and his dorm room at Harvard uh, uh, figuring out how, how to put him and his classmates in touch with one another. So, so new and innovative ideas, or the most innovative ideas, come from small business. But uh, eventually, they have to be scaled up to reach the world. And, that, and, and so typically, either the small business grows into a big business, or it's acquired by a big business. Uh, the short answer to your question, which is a very good one, is I, I think, as in the past, we're going to need a combination of small businesses and large businesses to do the job of the economy. We'll need the, the, the cutting edge entrepreneurs who are creating small businesses. We'll need the large businesses to provide the, the, the cutting edge entrepreneurs ideas to make, to make those ideas available on a large scale. Um, I know this seems like a very um, um, normal question, um, but I want to ask that since you are a part of the International Peace Foundation and you're doing this conference, um, I'm wondering how is this uh, event or this um, foundation means so much to you that you would come here and talk with us? That's a, that's a wonderful question. Uh, I, I should say I'm not actually part of the International Peace Foundation myself, but uh, uh, Uwe Morowit over there uh, is the founding director of the uh, founding chairman of the foundation. Uh, he was kind enough to invite me to, uh, to do a tour of Southeast Asia. This is actually the second one that I've done, uh, visiting different countries. That on, on this trip, we're, uh, we've been in Thailand and uh, the Philippines already. So this is the third stop on, on, the, uh, on the tour. Um, and well, I'm, I'm speaking for Uva here, but uh, if, you, if, you'll, if you'll allow me, I mean, the, the idea is that one way to make the world more peaceful uh, is to, to have dialogues, to have conversations uh, between uh, scholars, researchers, artists of different countries. So, so, so what Uva has done is to uh, bring people like me to, uh, to Asia, to talk to people like you. And, and, the, and the idea is that through these conversations, we will 
understand ideas better, we will understand one another better, and you know, when people understand one another, they're not so likely to be in conflict. Uh, uh, wars, for example, typically break out between ideologies, uh, uh, religions, where uh, there's a lack of mutual understanding through, through conversation. We uh, can eradicate those uh, misunderstandings. At least that's the principle. And because I believe the principle's right, I'm very happy to, to participate. <laughs>